Brown. That's an unbelievable shot. Well, what a way to save the break points. First with an ace, and this is the shot of the match. Look at this. And look at the footwork as he finishes off here. Fantastic shot from Moyer. Moya. And come at the hour. Moya then with set point. Well, it's been an indifferent set as far as quality is concerned, but Moya finished it off in spectacular style. Into the second set. And we pick it up at five games each. But Moya with a second break point. He's already had one here for a second to go 6-5. Moya. Strikes again to lead 6-5, and we pick it up with Moyer at 40 love with three match points. This then for a place in the semi-final of the ATP World Championships. Well, it was hardly a coincidence that it happened there. A match that's been riddled with tension, some outstanding shots, but a lot of unforced errors. A match that meant so much to both men. Second match point. So Moyer's made it through to the semi-final again and revenge for last year. When you come back, Henman against Rosetsky. The Babolat string is the, is the best string that's made. Team between Tim Henman against uh, Greg Rosetsky. Last meeting on the ATP Tour, Rosetsky won last year in Vienna, 6-4, 6-4. Henman already threw because he'd won his two group matches. Rosetsky had to win today to keep his hopes alive and then hope that uh, in tonight's match, Alex Koretja beat Albert Costa. Well, Rosetsky started like an express train. Broke in the third game to lead 2-1 and then to lead 4-1. As we pick it up, he has three set points at 5-2. Comprehensive mauling. And Hemman never really got started in that set. Looked a little flat, then he came out. A lot of errors. A lot of tension, it seemed, for both men. And we pick it up in the second set now. With Tim Hemman leading five. With Rosetsky leading 5-2. But Tim Hemman with three breakback points. to save the break point. Second set very much the same as the first. Rosetsky broke to lead 2-1 and then again to lead 4-1. And now looking pretty good to save the break. Two break points saved. Control of that at all. 
Fulsome apology from Rosetsky. But that's a poor volley and he hasn't missed too many of those forehand volleys. But you can see there the tension beginning to take hold. He nearly missed one in the previous point, just got the top of the net. Fourth break back point for Henman. Couldn't have been closer. And the Henman supporters in full voice. And many of the neutrals who want this to go on. It's uh, been a quick-fire match. Fortile, Ruzeski. So, match point. Henman would normally have backed himself to make that. Plenty of time to line it up. Turn two. Hemman just making Rosetsky suffer a little here. And a fifth break point. Speed Ouch. Hemman. So Hemman taking the game to close up to 3-5. Held his serve to go 4-5. And now we pick it up with Rosetsky serving for the second time for the match. 30 love. Oh. A little hop skip from Rosetsky. Match point number two, but this time he's got three of them. Wait, wait, please. A big win for Rosetsky, and he'll go through if Albert Costa beats Koreccia tonight. Now, Jaco Elting, who showed up a bit late because he had a little thing to do last week, he became world champion. Congratulations. Thank you in doubles, much. not quite in singles, but anyway, why did it take you three days to come to Hanover? Well, I don't have one, one good explanation for that, is that I was so drunk I needed three days to get sober. <laughs> Good stuff for you. How was that week? Uh, it was very nice. Uh, the beginning of the week obviously was a bit strange. There was not a lot of people there. But uh, then uh, from Friday on it became very good. We started playing better. And obviously, you know, to end uh, the year as the number one player, as the number one team, and winning the world title, couldn't be better. So what's up for you in the future? Well, if I knew, you know, that's maybe the good thing about life. You don't really know yet, but... Uh, well, I, I guess I probably have to ask you guys what's going to be after tennis, you know? I don't know yet. Well, what's after tennis, that's what people don't know here. You're actually going to retire, and what you don't know, life is never going to be the same. And so for you to remember, we have a little clip. feeling well you're retiring after the best year you ever had you won the Australian Open you won the French Open you won Wimbledon and maybe you would have won the US Open if your uh, wife wouldn't have had uh, a, chick, a uh, kid right there so you're obviously a family man usually uh, people don't retire when they're very successful how come you're so different well, I don't know it's uh, I cannot make a decision for someone else but I just felt it, it's very difficult just to keep on playing the doubles although we're so successful and that we won a lot, there's not a lot to be won uh, next year. That's the way I feel about it, and um, I'm, I'm really happy that, that my total career feels good, 
but I do miss the singles. If I had a chance to play singles for a few more years, I would have loved to. But just to play the doubles, I find it too, too difficult. Beth, don't you, don't you find it extraordinary somebody retiring on top? Uh, well, yeah, I can, I can understand. I think it's always difficult to make a decision to retire. But, I mean, you're a very good singles player as well, and you had a lot of injuries. Is, did that come into your, your thinking about retiring or make, making a singles comeback? Well, I, I didn't have a lot of injuries. I actually never missed a match because of injury, but until my knees uh, really got bad, my, especially my right knee. And this year I didn't practice. You know, I shouldn't maybe say it too loud, but I didn't practice at all. I just played 15 tournaments in doubles. And if I do, in, if I do the work which I have to do to play well in the singles, my knee gets bad in about a week or two weeks again. Really? So I didn't have a choice. I had to just play the doubles. And right now I like to be the chief when to stop. In singles I had to stop. I was forced to stop. And doubles, now I'm the boss. I want to say this is fine. That's it. Emilio, when you stopped, how did you feel? Was there life after tennis or uh, did you feel like you died and went to heaven because you didn't have to practice anymore? Or what can he expect? <laughs> well, for me it was a strange moment because I never, I never said like him, I stopped. I, I had a, a slow decompression. I, first year I played maybe 10 tournaments and the next year maybe I played 4 tournaments. And I also had a lot of things in my mind. I was running a tournament, I was promoting some kids. I, I, w I was always involved in other, in other things. So I was very busy and I didn't miss it. And, and I started uh, working with my sister as a coach. And I see it so tough that I, I don't miss it at all. I think tennis life is, is not so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about you, Pat? You're obviously trying to hang in. You had so many injuries. You tried to come back one more time, one more time. You obviously must love the game. Or is it also maybe there's a certain void when you don't play? Well, I think it was a very tough decision for me to, to, uh, to stop because I did make all these comebacks from injury. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I quite simply could not get into the tournaments. I couldn't get wild cards. Um, I couldn't get enough qualifying or, or singles wild cards to justify it, believe it or not. Um, you know, I got into... I think it was uh, seven tournaments last year. And, you know, I, you can't compete. You can't compete with the top guys with seven tournaments or eight tournaments. Um, so, you know, it was, it was quite easy uh, at the end of the day. But it, did, um, it took me a couple of months of sitting on the beach and then, as <laughs> Amelia said, all of a sudden it's like, hey, this is pretty good. You know, it's pretty comfortable when you sit <laughs> in the sand. All of a sudden you don't have to train, you know. But, so maybe uh, that's the advice that I have to go to the beach for several months now to to be able to, uh, to really retire. Yeah, had to, well, I wanted to think about what I'm going to do in the rest of my life. And the last thing, I, last thing I wanted to do was coach. And here I am now, I'm a coach. And uh, so, you know, just weird things happen, just strange things happen in life. And it's all very exciting. It's just I'm really looking forward to the rest of, the rest of my life, my career. And you've got everything to look forward to. And it's, uh, you know, and good luck to you. And it's, it's just uh, fantastic. You've got a lot of experience and a lot of great results. What more can you want? Well, Yaku, how early did you actually start to think about life after tennis? Well, my, maybe it has been also a problem. I always did it. I also had a lot of hobbies when I was still traveling. And, um, but especially from about a year ago, I think, end of 97, uh, that's when I stopped from singles for about four months. And I really found out, just for the doubles, I found it difficult. So I had to set a goal for myself to put in all the effort and to really know that's the end. I'm going to throw all the energy I have. I'm going to throw it into it. And it worked out well. We played you know, good tournaments, played good tennis. And I think if I wouldn't have done that, I don't think I would have played this, this well this year also. Mm. Well, you thought about it early, but uh, does someone like Carlos Moya, who is still young, think about it? Carlos saying, I, I still haven't thought what I'm going to do when I retire. I'm still young, and I hope to have many more years of tennis. But that will depend on the money you've earned and your feelings at the moment. At the moment, I feel like a kid of 15, so I don't have any plan. And that will uh, arrive during the course of time. Carlos hat einen sehr wichtigen Punkt angesprochen, nämlich das Geld. Er hat sicher jetzt schon genug, bei dir sieht es ein bisschen anders aus. I'm saying that Carlos is uh, making a very important point there. He's got enough money because he's done so well. But what about the players who don't have the big bank account? Do, do they have to go on playing? And uh, Carsten Brasch here saying uh, it's not that easy. 